Wake up. Wake up. Come on. Get up. What the? Get up. This is an emergency. The sergeant's having a heart attack. I felt someone shaking me violently. Where the hell was I? What the hell? Quick, get up. Some hands pulled me from where I was lying. I think it was a bed, I'm not sure. How did I get there? Calm down, I'm getting up. What? What's the problem? I was told you were a doctor. The sergeant is having a heart attack. You must come quickly. I sat up and discovered I had no shoes on. No matter, hands pulled me out of the tiny room I was in, and we walked down the hall to an office. Once there, I saw a woman in a police uniform bending over trying to give CPR to a large man, also in uniform. Oh, shit. I finally realized where I was, in a police station. Get out of my way. I knelt down and reached out to see if he had a pulse and was breathing. He had neither. Jesus. Do you have a defibrillator? I asked, looking at the woman who was attempting CPR. I think so, yes, I'll get it right away. She ran off. I started doing chest compressions. I did five and then did my best to get air into him. I was still under the influence of the many pints of Guinness I'd had the day before in the pub, but I was quickly weaned off them. While I was doing a second set of chest compressions, she came back with an AED, an automated external defibrillator. These are pretty common now and found in many public places. I hoped it had been checked recently and that the battery was still fairly charged. Get the pads out and turn it on. I was still doing chest compressions. She handed me the pads and I quickly ripped open his shirt and pulled up his undershirt. I attached the two pads to his chest and then turned on the EKG to make a charge. Luckily, the device was working and his voice told me to move farther away when he was doing the discharge. I pressed the button and zap. His whole body jerked. Nothing. The first time didn't work. Shit. I activated it again. Zap. Nothing. It didn't make his heart start working at a normal rhythm. Damn it. The third time was enchanted. Zap. Beep. Normal sinus rhythm, the machine proudly announced. Thank God. I exhaled. I sat down on the floor and put my hand on his chest to check his heartbeat. I felt it. It was weak, but it was there. I shouted to the policewoman, Did you call an ambulance? She mumbled something I couldn't make out. Do it now, shouted I. She fumbled for her cell phone. Sitting on the floor and monitoring the man's pulse and breathing, I looked around and realized I was in a police station. How the hell did I end up here? Slowly, I remembered that I had gotten drunk at a pub in town the night before. I looked out the window and saw that it was already morning. I looked at my watch. It was just over eight in the morning. I had sobered up in record time. A few minutes later, the policewoman came back and said that the ambulance would be another half hour. It was coming from the town of Trey Lee. Apparently, there is a hospital there. A concise guide to heart attacks. Defibrillation is only effective for certain heart rhythms, namely ventricular fibrillation or pulseless ventricular tachycardia, and not for asystole or pulseless electrical activity, which usually require treatment of underlying conditions to restore cardiac function. My own heart was racing. It must have been a combination of panic and the large amount of alcohol I had drunk last night. My armpits were wet and I really wanted to go to the bathroom. I called out to the policewoman. Come over here, sit here and put your hand on his chest. She sat down on the floor next to the unconscious sergeant and gently placed her hand on his chest. I can feel his heart. Okay, stay there while I go to the bathroom. Where is she? She pointed around the corner. I slowly made my way to the bathroom and drained a gallon of used Guinness. When I stepped out into the hallway, there were several other observers present. I looked at an incredibly young constable and asked him, Where the hell am I? His mouth was open and his eyes bulged a little, but he managed to say, Garda Station. I'm sorry, but I may have had a little too much to drink last night. What is this town and how did I get here? You're in Castleroy. Tommy and I from the pub carried you here last night when you passed out. Tommy said you had a great time before you collapsed. He smiled. Shit. You told everyone you ran away from a whore. Shit. The young constable grinned, looking at me. I heard the sound of an ambulance in the distance. The guys told me you're from the United States. Is that true? I made a grimace. Unfortunately, yes. They said you were a doctor. He said it more as a question than a comment. I nodded. Yes. The ambulance crew raced through the door and was taken to the office where the sergeant was lying on the floor. The paramedics performed the usual routine check of his heart and breathing. My work here was done.
I watched them load him onto a stretcher and carry him to the ambulance. When they left, ostensibly to take him to the hospital in Tralee, I went in search of my boots and jacket. I found them on the floor next to my bunk in the tiny room I had occupied to sleep off the previous evening's festivities. I found a policewoman, another constable, and asked her if I could leave. She looked at me and, without saying a word, nodded. I sat down on the bunk, put on my boots, and turned the sleeves of my jacket inside out. It was rolled up in a ball. My wallet and cell phone were in my pockets. I walked back into the main office and looked around. Everyone, all four of them, two standing, two sitting, were looking at me without saying a word. I decided that any transgressions I might have committed in the pub were forgiven. I was beginning to feel slightly dizzy. Say, does anyone know where I'm staying? All four heads turned in the same direction, as if one could see through the two-foot-thick stone walls of the police station. It turned out that I was staying in a boarding house only a couple hundred yards from the police station. As I slowly made my way there, I inhaled and exhaled to get some fresh air into my lungs. I needed to sleep, take a long hot shower, drink coffee, and eat in that order. I started by buying a large bottle of water from the store on the way in, and drinking it in one big gulp. When I entered the guest house, I was greeted by the lovely lady who ran the place. I see you're back after an evening of fun at the pub. Would you like some breakfast? I've got some excellent roast potatoes ready. I'd really like a coffee if you have one. I may have overdone it a bit last night. Oh, I heard. When you didn't come back after the pub closed, I called the Garda and asked about you. They said you'd had a bit too much to drink and were now safely tucked up in one of their beds. I left it at that and went to bed myself. She smiled at me and went to prepare the food. I smelled the odor and I was immediately hungry. Her husband walked in and smiled at me. You've had a busy day for a Sunday. I looked at him, huh? He smiled. The guys at the station called and told me what you did for Sergeant O'Boyle. You saved his life. Mary, come here. We have a hero living with us. She shouted, what are you saying, Bill? She ran out and Bill continued. I want to tell you that our guest saved Jerry's life. He had a heart attack while sitting in his office, and this young man saved him from certain death. He is a doctor from the United States. I looked at them and tried to raise my hand. It's really no big deal. Nothing, my ass. Bill looked at his wife. He saved that man's life. Keep in mind, Jerry was expecting a heart attack. He looked at his wife and continued. He performed CPR and used that electronic thing to get Jerry's heart going again. They both looked at me like I was about to recount the events. I just wanted coffee and breakfast. I could use some coffee if you have it. She nodded and left for the kitchen, and soon reappeared with a coffee pot and a cup. I sat down and drank almost the entire pot of coffee, along with a large plate of food. Scrambled eggs, ham, fried tomatoes, beans, and toast. It was all delicious. I figured the sergeant had eaten too many of those Irish breakfasts over the years and, as Bill said, was waiting for a heart attack. After eating, I went to my room, took a long hot shower, and lay in bed to bring my world into a semblance of order. A dream, a wonderful dream. You want to know a little bit about me, don't you? My name is Aaron Brown. I am 33 years old, my height is 5 feet 11 inches, and my weight is 170 pounds. I have black hair and blue eyes. I work as an orthopedic surgeon in Albany. I completed my surgical residency two years ago and now work or have worked at University Hospital. I'm married to Madeline McDonald Brown and we have no children. At least I don't. Maddie is an elementary school teacher. She's 32 years old, also from Albany. Born and raised there. Her family still lives in the neighborhood. My family, not so much. My mother and father live in a beach community in North Carolina. They retired there last year to live in warmer weather than central New York and play golf. My mother has a little arthritis and my father, while in good health, doesn't like winter. So they retired to a warm place and are enjoying it. I have a sister who lives in Connecticut with her husband and two children. She is two years older than me. Karen and Dave and their boys, Ryan and Ben. My parents spoil their grandchildren, and the boys love the beach when they come to visit. So how did I end up in Ireland? That's what you really want to know. Fair question. I guess I vented my anger last night and talked too much about my problems in the pub, so I guess by now almost the whole town was aware of my problem. Yes, I had a problem, past tense. My problem's name was Madeline McDonald Brown. I and almost everyone else called her Maddie. I said some things in the pub that maybe I shouldn't have said. That's what too much Guinness does to you. It's like a truth serum. After a few pints of this drink, you spill all your insides and secrets to complete strangers. 
I left Albany when my marriage fell apart. It was sudden. That was about a month ago. For the last three weeks, give or take a couple days, I've been in Ireland. I've been traveling around the island on a motorcycle I bought from a dealer in Dublin. It's a Honda CRF 250. Basically a dirt bike with headlights, turn signals, and a speedometer. The bike was in good condition, and I bought some side racks to attach a few things to it that I took with me. It wasn't much, I can tell you that. Most of my stuff in Albany either went to the Salvation Army donation box or I threw it in the trash. I only kept the few things that I absolutely needed. Things that I could pack in my car. The rest I just threw away. I talked to a friend about hitting the road and he gave me some great recommendations that I followed. He left an unfaithful wife a couple years ago. I've been doing the same thing. A month before. Maddie comes from a pretty big family. She has a sister and two brothers. Her sister Lana is a housewife with one child. One of her brothers, Rob, is an aircraft mechanic. Her other brother, Barry, is a contractor. He builds houses and makes a good living. Maddie's mother and father still live in Albany and are both retired. Her mother was a teacher and her father was a banker at a national bank. They both live well with good pensions and investments and enjoy traveling in their Georgetown RV. Back to me. Doctors lead very different lives. Yes, we are paid very well, but we work very long hours and don't have a lot of free time for our personal lives at the beginning of our careers. This was certainly a major factor in my situation. My colleague and friend Dave Walters suffered from the same thing I'm now facing. He walked away from his marriage. He left his cheating wife and found a new wife. Why is there such a high percentage of physicians' spouses who are prone to infidelity? I mean, it seems to be all too common for physicians. Their spouses seem to have a need for it all. Dave came out of that situation well. He has a new wife, a wonderful woman from Germany, and they have two children. He met her in Africa, I think. He landed on his feet. I talked to him and he told me that he met her completely by accident. But it was the happiest and greatest day of his life, especially considering how his marriage had collapsed. I knew exactly what he was talking about. Like I said, I don't have any kids. Maddie has one child. A girl. She was born just a few weeks ago. Yes, you got that right. Her child is not mine, even though we've been married for four years. The child is the product of her affair with another man. When the baby was born, I was totally screwed. You see, I'm white, Maddie is white, and her baby is clearly biracial. So you can do the math. Before you all label me a racist, the baby was just a messenger. The great opening of Maddie's novel took place in the delivery room. I was sitting on a stool next to my wife, holding her hand and practicing my breathing as the baby began to emerge. The doctor asked me to cut the umbilical cord, and when the baby came into the world, I was ready and waiting with scissors in one hand and Maddie's hand in the other. What a damn surprise that was. I will never forget the look on the doctor's face when she delivered the baby. Her eyes got very wide and she turned her head to look at me. I stood there stunned as a stone, and the doctor calmly took the scissors from me and cut the umbilical cord. The doctor placed the baby in the hands of a nurse awaiting delivery, and he was taken away to have his airway suctioned. Eye drops dripped, weighed and measured, and then wrapped in a heated blanket. The labor and delivery nurses were talking among themselves and looking at Maddie and me. Doc looked at me and then told the nurse to take the baby to her mother. I looked at Maddie holding the baby. Maddie, Maddie, uh, how? Oh, shit. It was the same as if I'd been punched in the stomach by Mike Tyson. I couldn't breathe. I blinked a hundred times, thinking my eyes were deceiving me. No, they were working fine. I sat down in the chair next to Maddie's bed and looked at the floor. Doc and the nurses were standing off to the side of the delivery room, waiting to see what would happen next. I waited until I could breathe again. I looked at Maddie and she was looking at her baby. She didn't say a word and I didn't say a word. I walked out of the room. I never talked to Maddie again. Over the next day, Maddie's parents called me several times to talk to me. Her mother left several voice messages on my cell phone. One day I did speak to her. I asked if she had seen the baby. When she said she had, she asked if I could forgive Maddie for her mistake and be a father to the baby. I replied, can you? I didn't get an answer. I ended the conversation. I never spoke to either of her parents again. A mistake. Getting pregnant by another man is not something you can explain away with. Oh, I'm sorry, honey. I made a mistake and got pregnant by accident. And move on with your life as if everything is fine. Nope. As I was leaving the hospital, I made sure that the birth certificate had the information filled out and listed the father's name as unknown. I signed the form and left.
After arriving home, I packed up everything I wanted and drove off. My old Subaru Outback was barely filled. I took some clothes, an iPad, a few things from medical school, and that was it. It only took me a few hours to sort through it all and load it into the car. I left my wedding ring on the kitchen table and walked away. My home that night was a hotel room. I was staying near the hospital where I worked. It was a different hospital from the one where Maddie had given birth. I was in a daze. Back to today. The day after my inglorious introduction to the town of Castleroy, as I got drunk in a pub and began to talk about my problems, I was visited by a string of people from the town. Mrs. O'Boyle first came in to see me at the boarding house. She thanked me warmly for saving the life of her useless husband, as she described him. But that was another story. Nevertheless, she offered to do her best for me in exchange for Jerry's life. I thanked her and told her I would look in on the sergeant at the hospital when he was allowed to visit, probably in a day or two. Next up was the mayor of Castleroy. She was a nice lady and brought along a couple of local officials who were curious to meet the American doctor who had stopped in their town and saved Sergeant O'Boyle from certain death. The mayor, a woman who I realized was in her late 50s and quite masculine in appearance, played the part of a politician. She and I were photographed for some unknown official record, and a group shot was taken of the mayor, her entourage, the owners of the boarding house, and me. The mayor calmly inquired as to what brought me to this quiet corner of Ireland. I mentioned that my family had emigrated from Ireland to the United States during the potato famine in the 1800s. I told her how my great-grandfather made his way to New York and settled in Albany. When he came to the U.S., he first went to Boston, but then decided he had more opportunities in Albany to work as a carpenter. I wanted to visit Ireland. I had never been to the country before. What I saw told me that I would not be done with Ireland for a long time. The mayor asked if I planned to stay in the area for a long time. I replied that I planned to ride my motorcycle around the Ring of Kerry and then head to Killarney. She laughed and nodded to the other two city officials. She looked me straight in the eye and began. Doctor? Brown, I would like to know, if I may, a little more about your practice in the United States. What kind of doctor are you? Well, I'm an orthopedic surgeon. I do bone repair, joint repair, skeletal repair, and things like that. I pointed my hands at myself. I also do general surgery when other surgeons are unavailable. I don't usually do thoracic or cardiac or neuro brain surgery. Those are very specialized things. They all looked at each other. Mary and Bill, the owners of the boarding house, nodded as if they had suddenly become close medical colleagues and were fully versed in the intricacies of surgery. Doctor, will you be returning to work in soon? Albany? No, I quit the hospital. I'm on a break. That's why I'm here in Ireland. The others nodded and cast concerned glances. A female police constable from the station had joined us the day before. The same one who had tried to give CPR to Sergeant O'Boyle. I pointed at her and said, That girl did an excellent job of resuscitating Sergeant O'Boyle. I nodded toward the constable. I'm sure she would have done just fine without me. The constable blushed heavily and smiled. Everyone else laughed and nodded at her. The mayor looked back at me and continued. Doctor? Brown, if I may, I would like to speak to you privately in my office. I have an important matter to discuss with you. Judging by her tone, I couldn't avoid this meeting, though I had no idea what she wanted to talk about. Sure, when would you like me to come by your office? Tomorrow morning will be best. I'm sure you'll have a lot to do today, and I don't want to encroach on your sightseeing time. After that, we shook hands and they left. The constable was the last to leave, and he gave me and the owners of the boarding house knowing glances. I had no idea what the hell was going on. Maybe it was an Irish peculiarity, but I would soon find out about it. Ireland is a very different place from what I'm used to back home in the United States. The Emerald Isle, as they call it, is called because everything is so green, especially in the summer. It was now September and the tourists had almost all left, so there was much less traffic on the roads. This meant it was much easier to get around. I slowly made my way through the country, stopping in small towns and staying a day or two to explore. The people are generally friendly and welcoming. The food is good and the beer is cold. Guinness is like Irish mother's milk. The national drink. I spent the day resting at the boarding house, and after lunch went for a walk. The sleep I had gotten after the visits of Mrs. O'Boyle and the mayor and her men was much needed. That evening I limited my beer consumption to one pint along with dinner. The next morning I got up early and after breakfast went to the mayor's office. I was met by another woman who obviously knew I was coming. You must be that American doctor. She said it more as a statement of fact than a question. I nodded. 
The mayor will be here in a minute, so please have a seat. It seemed I had arrived before the mayor. I sat down and waited for her to arrive. It was only a few minutes, during which I sat and pondered what I should do that day. I was in deep thought when I was interrupted. Dr. Brown, Dr. Brown, the mayor is here. Come in. Thank you. I went inside, was greeted by her worship, and invited to take a seat on the couch. Coffee was ordered and all the pleasantries of the day were listed. Did you have a good evening, Dr. Brown? Ah, yes. A quiet evening. Dinner at the pub was very pleasant. I apologized to the pub owner for my behavior on Saturday night, if that's what we're talking about. I told him that I was going through a difficult time in my personal life and had unfortunately had one too many beers and then raged and passed out. He was very kind and even bought me dinner and a pint of beer for my efforts on behalf of Sergeant. Oh, Boyle. She nodded at me, and I continued with what I thought she wanted to hear. I'll be leaving later today if that's what you're worried about. Oh, that's not what I asked you to come talk about. Okay, what the hell did she want? So I'm a little confused. If you don't care about me leaving your sweet little town, then what do you want to talk about? Doctor. Brown, I have a problem I need your help with. I looked at her with the most puzzled expression on my face. What can I be of use to Castleroy? Well, Dr. Brown, you're a doctor who doesn't have a contract in America, and Castlery is a town that needs a doctor. At least for a few weeks until the government in Dublin gets off its ass and finds a replacement for Dr. Kennedy, who has retired and gone to South Africa. Eh? What do you want? Do you want to hire me as a local doctor? Yes, that's essentially what the proposal is. We desperately need a doctor in the area. The nearest doctor is in Tralee, almost an hour away, and we have many fine people who would be forever in your debt if you would consider it a favor to help us out and stay for a few weeks. The Department of Health in Dublin says they will send a replacement, but it may take some time, so you understand that we need your help in the meantime. Jesus! I'm sorry. I'm not sure I'm your man, or in this case, your doctor. I'm a surgeon, and if I understand correctly, you need a doctor of family medicine. Doctor? Brown, right now I'll take anyone I can get my hands on. You, sir, are just the find we need. Yep, I don't know. Please think about it, but don't drag it out. We need you. Mary Johnson, mayor of Castlery. I spent hours on the phone with the geniuses in Dublin who distribute doctors around the country, and they told me it might be a year or more before we saw a doctor in the area again. Dr. Kennedy was now in his 80s and beginning to forget a great deal. His daughter took him to South Africa to live with her and her husband. They figured he wouldn't have far to go to a nursing home. So, I was on the phone checking out the American gift that had fallen to our lot. It's amazing what the Garda can figure out when they have enough motivation. It only took overnight to put together a quick dossier on Dr. Brown. I know that he graduated from medical school in New York State in the top third of his class, and that he's a board-certified surgeon. I also know a little about his personal life and can sympathize with how disgustingly his wife treated him. No wonder this man got drunk at the pub. I need to come up with some kind of incentive to convince him to stay with us for a few months. I have a plan. I also have urgent permission from the Department of Health for Dr. Aaron Brown to practice medicine in Ireland. Get it, government. Whatever it is. PC Amelia Kelly, Castleroy Police. I saw Dr. Brown coming out of the mayor's office and walked in his direction. I was technically off duty, so I wasn't wearing a uniform. I was dressed in my best casual outfit. A white blouse, skinny jeans, and high-heeled boots. My hair was done today and I had a little makeup on. Yes, I tried to be as attractive as possible this morning. I'm only 27, my height is about 5 feet 8 inches, and my weight is just over 9 stone. I do a lot of running and to be honest, I am in great physical shape. Doctor? Brown! I shouted from a distance. He turned his head to see where his name came from. I walked over to him. Dr. Brown. Good morning. It was nice to meet you here this morning. I held out my hand. We haven't been introduced to each other yet. I'm Amelia Kelly. I'm the constable who helped you when you rescued Sergeant O'Boyle. Aaron. Oh, oh my God. Oh my God. Police uniforms are great at disguising people. I wouldn't have recognized this woman if she hadn't told me who she was or where she worked. I must admit my first encounter with her was marked by a certain, uh, vaguely chaotic. At the police station, and then when she showed up at the boarding house, she was in uniform. At that time, my attention was occupied by the mayor and her people. Plus, I'll admit, I was a little hungover. That's an understatement. I was pretty hungover. This woman, Amelia. Gorgeous. She has shoulder-length red hair, a beautiful ruddy face, and perfect figure. 
Oh, wow. I should have seen her before. Must have been distracted. Amelia Kelly is beautiful as a runway model. She's the beauty from Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Edition. What the hell is she doing working as a police officer? Amelia Kelly. Dr. Brown looked much better than the last time I saw him. I have seen a lot of men who get drunk, spend the night at the gate, and come home the next day. They all have the same disheveled look and are usually embarrassed to some degree. But Dr. Brown was very quick to shake off the effects of drunkenness when he needed to help Sergeant O'Boyle. No, Dr. Brown was fully engaged and knew what needed to be done. I tried to help, but completely forgot about that thing, the electronic defibrillator, which would have probably caused the sergeant to die. It was a very good thing for the sergeant that Dr. Brown had had too much to drink in the pub the night before. He looks great. The mayor asked us to make inquiries about him, and I know he left his wife in America. She dated another man, allegedly got pregnant and had a child with him. Dr. Brown thought it was his child until it was born, and then, as they say, the proof was in the pudding. The mayor talked about his grand plan, and I was the one who called Dublin and got a quick report on Dr. Brown. So I know a little more about him than he thinks I do. Aaron. Oh my God, that woman. I don't even know what to say. She's probably the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. We all have our own ideas of beauty. Amelia Kelly defined beauty for me. I couldn't look away. I shook my head slightly to make sure my eyes were working properly. They were. So, Dr. Brown, are you going to another part of Ireland today? My brain wanted to say something, but couldn't find common ground with my vocal cords and mouth, so I ended up with an inarticulate, ah. Well, ah, uh, I haven't decided what my plan is yet. Why was I starting to sweat? I'll probably visit Sergeant O'Boyle in the hospital, and then I plan to drive around the Ring of Kerry. I hear it's worth the trip there. She smiled at me. Oh, I was just on my way to Traley to see Jerry. Would you like to come with me? How could I resist? Well, I don't want to make you uncomfortable. Don't worry. I'd be happy to keep you company for the trip. We walked over to where her car was parked. She drives a VW Golf. I find driving on the left side a little weird, but when you're on a motorcycle, it's somehow not so wild. But that's just me. The trip to Traley only took 45 minutes, but I have no idea what we passed by on the way there. I looked at Amelia. I chatted with her, trying to learn as much as I could about her. I tried not to sound like an idiot, stumbling over my words. She seems to have grown up in Castleroy, and her father was one of the local barristers. Her mother stayed at home and brought her and her two brothers up. The family lived a few miles away in the countryside, and she lives in an apartment in the town, not that far from the police station. She is 27 years old and plans to go to law school, but first wanted to get some police experience. I also found out that she is single and currently has no boyfriend. For a while, she was engaged to a guy who was a semi-professional soccer player, but he got an offer to play for a team in Spain, and it ended. Plus, he seemed to find Spanish women very attractive. We visited Sergeant O'Boyle and talked with him for a few minutes. He learned from his wife and other visitors that I had heroically rescued him from the clutches of certain death. He promised to give up fried food and beer to drop at least four stone and get in shape. He was confident that by next year he would be running half marathons. Looking at him, I wasn't so sure. We'll see if he manages to do it. Amelia told me, after we left him, that an inspector came from Killarney and told Jerry that he had to lose a lot of weight or they were going to force him into early retirement. Jerry needs money for his pension, so he has no choice but to take up exercise. His wife will whip him and work him until he gives up. Traley isn't the biggest town, but it has two hospitals, so it's considered a big town in Ireland. A brief guide to Traley. It is a town of about 25,000 people, urban and rural, in County Kerry on the Dingle Peninsula. It has a port, a small airport, and two hospitals. Dublin is about a three-hour drive to the east, and Killarney and Limerick to the south, about an hour away. I offered to buy us lunch in exchange for her giving me a walking tour of the city. Amelia said she knew it well, as her father was often here at the courthouse working on a case. She went to university at Trinity College in Dublin, home of the Book of Kells. Her undergraduate degree is political science, and she focused on EU defense policy and international relations. At lunch, I decided that I would be asked the usual questions. What is an American doing traveling around Ireland on a motorcycle? Where did I grow up? What about my family? Where did I go to school? We ate, I recounted. She dodged the obvious question. What about your wife? Did you say in the pub the night you got drunk that you had a wife? I stayed away from the subject too. 
I had a great day with Amelia, but never made it to Ring of Kerry. When we got back to Castlery, she dropped me off at the guest house and I thanked her for the ride and the tour of Traley. I knew that as long as I stayed in this town, I would probably get to see more of Constable Amelia Kelly. And that would be a pleasure. Two days later, a trip around the Ring of Kerry. My goodness, how beautiful this countryside is. It was a fantastic day. I got up early, had a snack, and got on the bike to start my ride around the Ring of Kerry. I rode as far as Kilorglin and then to Killarney and stopped there for gas and coffee. The town is very interesting, and I was served some delicious pastries to accompany my coffee. I decided to drive clockwise around the ring so I wouldn't get stuck behind the huge tourist buses that travel counterclockwise. Bill at the guest house gave me this advice. My day was fantastic and included several stops to admire the beauty of the land and sea. I tried my best not to think about anything else but what I was doing at that minute. I was focused on the here and now and nothing else. Ireland is very beautiful. Of course, no day in Ireland would be complete without rain. And it did. As I drove back, the heavens opened and the rain poured down like a bucket. I stopped under a tree to wait it out. I was sitting sideways on my bike seat drinking a soda when I heard a huge crash to my left. Shit, a cloud of smoke was rising from the wrecked car. Shit. I threw the bottle into the ditch, sorry Ireland, put on my helmet, jumped on my bike, started it up, and with a quick glance over my right shoulder, headed for the crash site. It was about 400 meters away, and when I got there, I saw that a minibus and a passenger car had collided head-on. Oh crap. I figured one of them had hydroplaned and crossed the center line of the road. The roads here are inherently narrow, so there's little room for error. The car was badly wrecked. Smoke was coming from the engine compartment. I quickly assessed the situation and decided that everyone in the car should get out before a full-blown fire started. The doors of the car were damaged, and it was almost impossible to open the driver's door. The back door of the car had opened on impact. I climbed inside and saw the man sitting behind the wheel bleeding. There was a woman in the passenger seat. She was unconscious or dead. I couldn't tell yet. I reached out to see if she had a pulse and found one. He had a pulse too. By then, other cars had stopped and people were reaching out for help. I shouted to one of them to call 999 and ask them to send four ambulances. I knew that two were needed for the car passengers, but I didn't know about the minibus. I didn't want to transport people in a car with no backrests or neck braces to stabilize them before we even tried to move them. But the smoke from the front of the car was the deciding factor. They couldn't burn just to avoid further injury during the move. One man came running in with a fire extinguisher and started spraying it on the engine. This seemed to stop the immediate threat. I told the others to hold still for now. When I got to the minibus, the worst was the driver. He had cuts and lacerations all over his face and upper body from the glass that had shattered on him. He was covered in his own blood. I thought the safety glass was supposed to prevent this. There were four other people in the minibus, all relatively elderly tourists on a tour of the Ring of Kerry. Among them were a man and his wife, who were in their 80s, and her two sisters of about the same age. They were all in a state of shock and were asking what they should do. I quickly looked around at everyone to see how badly they were hurt. Fortunately, they were all wearing seatbelts. One of the women had what appeared to me to be a broken collarbone due to a seatbelt. Older women tend to have brittle bones due to calcium loss with age, so I wasn't surprised by her injury. She was clearly in pain, but she held up well, told me she was fine and to get her brother-in-law checked out. He had cancer a few years ago and she was worried about him. I tried to make a joke about the weather in Ireland, but they were all talkative and that said they were in relatively good shape. Tomorrow they would be sore from a combination of the effects of the accident and stress. I walked back to the car and some of the people who had stopped got blankets and towels to keep the man and woman in the car warm. I was worried about internal injuries. They are hard to see without a CTS machine and possibly an MRI. The man had what appeared to be a compound fracture in his right leg and had to be immobilized. I applied a tourniquet to his thigh to reduce blood loss. I quickly assessed their injuries and decided we needed to get them out of the car if possible. Four of us slowly extracted them from the car and laid them down on the road. I did some more work and then went back to check on the condition of the passengers in the van. It seemed to take forever before the ambulances got there. Of course, they would have to come from Traley, and there were only two available. I used the first aid kit in the van to bandage the most serious cuts on the driver, a gentleman named Fergus. A vivacious man in his 60s, he told me he was a retired accountant and moonlighted as a driver a couple days a week to get out of the house and out from under his wife's feet. 
the sound of ambulances could be heard in the distance. Fortunately, no one had died yet. That's always a good thing. I waited until all seven people had been taken to the emergency department in Tralee. The paramedics knew what they had to do, but I planned to follow the ambulances into town and make sure the attending EMTs were informed of what we were doing for first aid. One of the paramedics looked at me and commented, You're the American doctor who saved the police sergeant from Castlery, aren't you? I nodded at her. Sounds like you're in the thick of things. Good thing you were there on Sunday. We chatted for a few minutes and I told her that I had been sightseeing on the Ring of Kerry that day and was just on my way back to Castlery when the accident happened. I stayed at the hospital for about an hour, talked to the emergency doctor on duty, looked at all the accident victims, wished them well and got on my bike to head back to Castleroy. By the time I reached the guest house, it was already dark. A van was parked in front of the house. I took off my helmet and walked through the front door. I was immediately greeted by Bill and Mary. Oh, you're back, Dr. Brown. Hi, Bill Mary. Yeah, I was a little later than I planned. I'm going to clean up and find some food at one of the restaurants. Maybe there's a place around here that serves something not deep fried. Well, yes, there's an Italian place about a kilometer from here. Not far from the market. But a few minutes ago, there were people from the news bureau in Killarney here looking for you. What did they want? What did they say? They said you were in an accident. No, I was near a car accident and stopped to help, that's all. Well, it seemed to them that you single-handedly saved the lives of seven people. Bill and Mary looked at me wide-eyed and smiled. I helped give them first aid, that's all. They're in hospital in Tralee now, and they'll be taken care of there. Bill pointed with his thumb. The news is waiting for your return at the pub. They want to interview you. Bill was overcome with excitement. He grabbed his hat and ran out the door. Mary looked at me. He told them he would pick them up when you got back. They can't wait to talk to you. Shit. That's not what I want right now. I just want to eat dinner, maybe have a glass of wine, take a hot shower, and get some sleep. I smiled at Mary. I'm going to go to the pub. I walked out the door. I kind of lied to Mary. I wasn't going to the pub. I was going in the other direction. A little misinformation would buy me time to get to the restaurant and get a bite to eat before I was besieged by the, by the newbies, whoever they were. I was partially successful. I managed to grab some food before they found me. Bill seemed to be leading the search party. James Little is an attorney, Albany, New York. I needed to speak to a client. As far as I knew, he was somewhere in Ireland, but I had his cell phone number. It was weird. Started with plus 353 and then a bunch of numbers. Well, I need to tell Aaron some news and find out what he wants to do. After I got his number. One ringgit, two ringgit, three ringgit. Hi. Damn it, Aaron, where are you, man? In Ireland, man. Where in Ireland? It's a small town in the southwest, Castleroy. A very small place on the coast. What happened? Well, I have some news. It's not what you want to hear. Maddie is refusing to cooperate with the divorce. She says she wants you to come home. She says that if you meet the baby, you'll get over, as she puts it. Your pain and everything will be fine. She, she can back off. That's what she can do. Tell her she has to find a guy to move in with her and be the father of her baby. It won't be me. Shit. I laughed a little. Yeah, that part won't happen to him. I had my investigator find out who the baby's father is. And it turns out it's the gym teacher at the high school in the neighborhood of the school where Maddie teaches. He is also the soccer coach. A guy named... I don't care what his name is. Man, the interesting thing is that he's married and has two kids. He's in no position to do anything but go to work every day and keep making money to support all those mouths and pay the mortgage. Maddie has little hope of him supporting her child or herself. So what does all this have to do with me? I'm not going to change my mind and play the clueless husband and father. I'm not going back to that shit show. Well, she wants to get child support for the child and herself. She's got to be kidding, right? No. How likely am I to pay? It's a big unknown right now. Establishing paternity shouldn't be a problem, but the courts often don't care about that. Any child that is born while you are married will be considered yours unless we apply to the court to have your parental rights terminated. Do this. Go to court and do exactly that. When the baby was born, I filled out the birth certificate, indicating that the father was unknown. Make sure she didn't change it. I will. Look, I don't recommend you go home just yet. It'll just give her lawyer a chance to drag us into court and get an order compelling you to pay now. Don't worry about that. I'll stay here, at least for a while. Ireland is a beautiful country, Jim, 
You should take a vacation and come here. Have a beer, eat some food, and look at women. Thanks, but I have clients who don't know how to wipe their ass without me. Maybe next year. See you soon, man. Later. Aaron. Stupid woman. Thinks I'm gonna bend over backwards and do what she wants. Ain't gonna happen. She did it. She can live with it. I refuse to be married to a woman who thinks so little of me that she gets another man pregnant and then has the nerve to think I'll think, no problem, honey. I don't mind that you had fun with some guy and had his baby. No. Hell no. The mayor of Castlery. There he is. I didn't have to wait long. Dr. Brown. Dr. Brown. Ah, Madame Mayor, good morning. Doctor? Brown, you're a real hero. Oh, how's that? Come on, you saved seven people in that horrible car accident. Don't be modest, doctor. You're all over the news this morning. It wasn't that bad. Three of them got away on their own. One has a broken collarbone, but it's not that serious. The other one has mostly cuts. He'll recover. The passengers in the car were hurt the most, but they'll recover well. No one was killed, and that's the most important thing. Now I need a huge cup of coffee, and I have to do some more sightseeing in this beautiful country. Have you given further thought to my offer? I have spoken to Dublin again, and they will grant you a temporary license to practice here in Ireland for one year. Castleroy needs you, doctor. The region needs you. Please stay with us and help us. Mayor. Hmm. I'm going to go and see some more of the region, and when I return, I'll let you know my decision. How about it? I suppose that's fair enough. But please think about how you will make a difference in the lives of the people here. We're a small town, but we're a good town, and right now we need you. Dr. Aaron Brown nodded his head, turned, and walked away. I hoped that his personal problems in Albany would be what convinced him to stay with us for a while. Even if he was only here for six months, it would give Dublin time to do his job and find us a doctor. We'll see. Aaron. I started my motorcycle and went for a ride. I went to Killarney. I wanted to find a restaurant and think about what I wanted. After talking to Jim, I was pretty sure of it. Going back home to Maddie's wasn't part of my plans. Every day I was out of the country was a day she would have to think about what she had done. But maybe she didn't care. That wasn't out of the question either. All I knew for sure was that I wasn't coming home to her. Lunch was delicious, and the trip went without incident. As I was driving back to Castlery, my phone started ringing and buzzing. I stopped and looked at it to see what the emergency was. A text came in from Jim. Sending you a link to a TV news article. You're a hero. I listened to the message he left. Dude, what the hell? You saved a bunch of lives in Ireland. You're all over the news here. I'll send you a link to the video. Give me a call. Later. There was another voicemail, already from Amelia. Aaron, I know you're out riding today, but call me when you get back. I returned to Castlery and went to my room in the boarding house. Mary met me on the way and offered to make tea if I needed a cup. I thanked her but declined the offer. I took a shower and changed into a clean shirt and pants. I walked up to the mayor's office and asked for a meeting. The secretary smiled at me as she called the mayor. So, Dr. Brown, you've had a chance to consider our offer, and what have you decided? I've decided to stay in Castleroy and help you deal with the physician shortage. The woman encased me in a huge hug and nearly strangled me right on the spot. Aaron, you won't regret this. I promise you that. She omitted the word doctor, and it was clear that I was now one of them. Not so fast, Mayor, there are conditions. Her expression changed slightly as she realized that this case wasn't all in her hands. And what would that be, Aaron? Okay, nothing too big. I held up my hands. I listed what I wanted and she took notes, nodding at everything. When I was done, I said, so do you still want me? Oh yes, everything on this list is easy to do. Most of what you want is already there. You just need to take a step and start practicing medicine. Amelia. Good news travels fast in small towns, and bad news travels even faster. The mayor called and said that Aaron had agreed to stay on for a while and fill in for the district doctor. Word about him spread like wildfire, and within a day there was a line of people waiting to see him at the office. All of Dr. Kennedy's patient records were still kept in the office where he practiced. The nurse had retired when he left, so he put a lock on the building so things wouldn't go missing. The mayor hired a secretary for Aaron a young girl who had just graduated from high school and was looking for a job. The local traveling nurse practitioner could also come and help. She took some urgent cases, but she had a large territory and was here half a day a week at best. Now that Aaron was here, she could come more often. NP, Laura Tompkins. Laura is about 35 years old, divorced. 
She has a daughter who is about four years old. Her husband, now ex, is a manager in a shipping company that operates out of Dublin. Will had an eye for women, especially when his wife was out of sight. This got him into trouble. She left their home in Dublin and took a job in Killarney. She lives near Castlery. Laura is a pretty woman, blonde and tall. She's a little fatter than me, but still very attractive. I may have to watch her and claim her if she gets too close. Aaron. Oh my God, this office smells, uh, musty. It needs a good airing and maybe a good cleaning. If I find dead cockroaches and mouse shit, well, I guess it can be cleaned up. Administrator Nicole is brand new, and this is her first real job since graduation. She still wears braces on her teeth. Her mom came into the office and brought her lunch. Her mom was very excited to meet me and smiled a lot. Her mom was in her early 40s, and I noticed that she had dressed up a bit for such an occasion. The first thing I had to do was to get my office in order. I took an inventory and made a list of things I would need. I had a phone number to call to arrange delivery, and we logged into the computer system to access health department resources. I didn't even have a stethoscope. I didn't have the ability to write a prescription, called scripts here, for a patient. I also had to plug into the system to refer patients to tests and specialists. It'll be a few days before I can start seeing patients. Yeah, that's what I thought. People in the neighborhood had a very different opinion. And then it started. Doctor? Brown! Dr. Brown! Nicole yelled at the top of her voice. What? You have to come out here now. Why? Just come out. Hurry up! Okay, okay. I walked out to the waiting area. There was a man sitting there with his arm wrapped in a towel and a woman with him. He looked pale like he was about to pass out. That's it. The woman started, holding out a plastic bag to me. I looked at it, and in it was what looked like a finger. Oh, shit. He cut his finger off in the tractor engine. I told him to be careful, but he never listens to me. My first real patient in Ireland. Go back to the exam room. I looked at Nicole. Call the hospital in Tralee and tell them I need them to try and reattach this man's finger. Then call an ambulance to get here as soon as possible. I had nothing but basic supplies to treat him. I sat him in a chair and asked him to put his hand on the examination table. Slowly, I turned his hand around to see the actual damage. There were two fingers missing. Did you find the second finger? I asked his wife. She hummed. No, that's the only thing I could find. She pointed her finger at the bag. Okay, I need to stabilize this wound and let's do what we can so the doctor at the hospital in Traley can reattach it. My first task was to reduce blood loss and treat the injury until the ambulance arrived. An hour later, my patient was on his way to the hospital. I was able to manage the blood loss and stabilize his condition. He turned very pale and started to lose consciousness when I unclasped his arm. I probably would have done the same thing if it had been my hand. The pinky and ring finger of his left hand were injured, and apparently it was the ring finger that had been in the plastic sandwich bag his wife had. I put ice on the finger and sent him to the hospital with them. So this was my first patient. My secretary managed to get the man's name from his wife, and she even offered his national medical card. I had completely forgotten about it. At home, my job was to operate and treat people. I didn't worry about health insurance. The administrative staff took care of that. Later that day, Laura Tompkins, the regional NR, stopped by. She is a very busy woman and didn't stay long. She gave me her business card. We chatted for just a few minutes, and then she had to leave to pick up her daughter. I learned from Nicole that she was a single mom and lived in the neighborhood. I put that information aside for the future. I needed a place to live. The boarding house wasn't bad, but there was no privacy from Mary and Bill's prying eyes, and I wanted my own space. It didn't have to be big. A tiny one-bedroom house was all I needed, and I wanted a reasonable kitchen so I could get my own food. I needed a place to park my motorcycle and possibly store my bike if I got one later. The apartment needed to be furnished because this was a short-term endeavor, and I didn't want to get rid of much when it came time to move, most likely back to the U.S. I contacted a real estate agent and began my search. The search lasted about an hour. The agent was Josephine Landers. She was a nice lady in her 40s, a little chubby but not unattractive. She knew I would need a place to live and had already picked it out for me. As I said about small towns, any news spreads very quickly. The apartment, that's what they call condos here, was about 50 square meters. That's about 500 square feet. And it had everything I wanted. I already had my name on the door. Doctor? Aaron Brown, Maryland. There's nothing better than being confident. 
Josephine proudly walked me through the apartment and pointed out all the elements that would be useful to me during my stay in the city. The apartment had many windows and a beautiful view of the fields down to the water. There was even a balcony where you could have your morning coffee or sit at the end of the day. She had thought of every detail. Linens and towels are easy to find. We have stores right here in town that can provide anything you will need, and I have alerted them to be ready to provide everything you need. All they need to know is what color you prefer. The woman had it all covered. This place really needed a doctor. I looked at her with a slight smirk. Sounds like you've thought of everything. She smiled back. Just trying to be helpful to my client. Later, I thanked Mary and Bill for taking care of me and carried my one bag of belongings from the boarding house to the apartment. When I entered the house, I said to none other than the walls, I'm home. Well, this will be home, at least for now. I went around the stores, picked out some bedding, a couple pillows, and two towels, and took them to the apartment. I ran them through the washing machine and then made the bed. Next was the food. I walked a couple blocks to the market and stocked up on the essentials, including beer and wine. I don't know why I bought wine. I don't drink it often. Usually only in the company of women and when it seems appropriate to what I'm eating or doing. But I did buy a bottle of white wine. It all went into the fridge, but the wine didn't stay there long. There was a knock on the door. Amelia. Josephine pulled into the station and reported, Everything is ready. Here's the address. She handed me a card with the address of the apartment Aaron was renting. I tucked it in my pocket and went home at the end of the shift to freshen up and change into more appropriate clothes. After taking a shower, I washed off the heaviness of the day, then put on some tight jeans and a sleeveless blouse, put on some eye makeup, and was ready to go out. I called a Chinese coffee shop and ordered food. I stopped by there and picked up my food and then drove to the address Josephine had given me. I rang the bell. After a couple minutes, I heard, Hello, how can I help you? I laughed. Police, open up. What the? Then there was the sound of the door opening, and I walked in. I heard the door on the second level open. I went up the stairs. We heard that someone might have broken into the house, so I came to check. He smiled. Do you always bring food for trespassers? Just the ones I like. Aaron. Waking up in someone else's bed, I realized I was in my new temporary apartment, or apartment. I also realized I wasn't alone. I looked at my cell phone to check the time. It was time to get moving. I nudged my partner lightly on the bed. Amelia, I have to go. She yawned. What time is it? 6.39. I need to get cleaned up and report to my new place of employment. I went to the washroom, emptied my bladder, and turned on the shower. The water heated up in a few moments. I jumped in and Amelia joined me a moment later. That's where it all started. James Little is a lawyer. Why can't people put two and two together and come up with something close to four? Because they don't want to do it, that's why. Aaron's wife, Madeline, refuses to realize that Aaron no longer wants anything to do with her. Her affair with a teacher soccer coach was the end of their marriage, especially when she had a child with him. Is that really so hard to understand? But she refuses to admit that Aaron is done with her. Finished, Kaput. I filed the paperwork with the court and delivered copies to her. I told her to have her attorney review everything, and we would set up an appointment to iron out the minor details. It was a simple divorce, but she is determined to turn it into a protracted case. It's only going to make her attorney fees more expensive. The fact that Aaron has left the country is also an indication of the court's intentions. The New York Supreme Court hears divorce cases, and I have a hearing scheduled for next week. It's all routine stuff for the court. I have DNA testing and photos of my client that I want to introduce into the case to prove that the child is not his. I want to get a court order to force the real father to provide the DNA sample and thus delay the child support issue for him. Madeline advised her attorney to seek marriage counseling. I could easily object. My client left the country to find a new job. Besides, marriage counseling has to be agreed to by both parties, otherwise it's just a waste of time and money. No, that's not an option. Madeline also wanted to know where Aaron was and wanted to know how to contact him. I had no right to give her this information and told her so. Her attorney tried to intimidate me by saying she would file a motion in court to force me to divulge this information. I'm not sure if she paid attention to it that day in law school, but it's part of the attorney-client privilege. Oh, yeah. Madeline even parked her ass outside my office waiting to meet me. She was sure Aaron would do a great job as her daughter's father. She'd even brought the baby with her. I took one look at the baby, just a normal toddler. They all look alike to me, except she's not Aaron's baby. If you have eyes, you can guess that. 
I decided that I would try to get the baby brought to court so the judge could take a look at her. That would clear things up quickly. I told my secretary not to let her in again. Unless she wanted me to represent her in another case, but only after this one was closed. Of course, the whole reason she wants Aaron to come home and take the place of husband again is because of money. The father of her child, a teacher soccer coach, has a wife and kids, and he's not rich. He lives on a teacher's salary, and his wife works as a business manager at a small car dealership. The pay is good, but again, no one got rich working there. Between the mortgage, monthly bills, food, and the cost of maintaining two cars, they work for his pension. Her job doesn't have a retirement plan. Fortunately, his job includes health insurance. No, Madeline wants errands to be able to earn. Plain and simple. She won't get it. The reality of the situation was that Aaron had given up everything they had. She hasn't realized that yet. She has the house and all its contents as well as the car. She can sell it all if she wants and move into an apartment or condo, her choice. The house is in foreclosure, but Aaron has already signed away his rights to it. When the house is sold, there should be enough money left over to make a nice down payment for a modest two-bedroom condo, perhaps. It's about money, period. Laura Tompkins, NP. I plan to visit the American doctor who was persuaded by Mayor Castlery to stay on for a while to replace Dr. Kennedy when he retired. The fact that he retired was a good thing. He had long since expired. I corrected many of his mistakes but couldn't always be there for him. He ended up prescribing the wrong thing and seriously injuring or killing the patient, so it was good that he retired. I met the new doc, Aaron Brown, I think his name is. He's nice looking. He's a surgeon, too. The local rumor mill quickly spread the word about him and his almost ex-wife. The mayor has ordered security to investigate, to find out who and what he is. The medical staff in Dublin contacted the Yanks, and they told them about his medical background and biography. Unmarried women in the neighborhood would line up to see him and get checked out. They will have a host of minor ailments that will cause them to have to get naked for the doctor to examine them. Yes, between work and my daughter, I don't have time to socialize. But I can find time to go into his office and talk to him about the challenges of caring for some of my patients. It will give me a chance to be alone with him. I'll have to dress nice that day. Aaron. My secretary is tired of answering the phone and talking to people who want to come to the doctor's office. They wait outside the office when I get there in the morning. I have noticed that the people who want to see the doctor are predominantly women. Maybe it is better for them to see a female doctor. Nurse practitioner Laura Tompkins may be a better choice for many of them, especially for more routine issues. I'll give her a call and ask her to come in when she has some free time and we can talk about what she does and how we can work together more effectively. Laura Tompkins, NP. My cell phone rang. I drove to the next patient and pressed the button on the steering wheel to answer it. Hello. Hi, is this Laura Tompkins? Yes, that's right. Who could you be? Good morning. I'm Aaron Brown, substitute physician at Castleroy. Doctor? Brown, how can I help you? I thought I knew how he could help me. I was wondering if we could get together to talk about the local health needs. I'm only filling in for you for a few months until they send a permanent doctor here, but I'm concerned that I don't know how things are usually done here. I'm on my own and I need help. Hmm, it would be nice if you and I could talk. When would you like to do that? Well, when you have time. I'll make the time. This is very important to me. I thought for a bit. I'm driving right now, I have a patient, but I'll call you later and we can find a time that works for both of us if that's okay with you. That would be great. Give me a call and let me know what works. Like I said, I really need your help. I started to come up with a plan in my mind. It would take a little time, but I had it and who knows, maybe Dr. Aaron Brown had it too. We'll see. Aaron, two days later. I got a call from Laura Tompkins, a local nurse practitioner, inviting me to her house for dinner. Who am I to turn down a home-cooked meal? I went. It was a short walk to her house. I decided to get a bottle of wine. I took two, one red and one white. I had no idea what she liked or if she liked wine at all. Irish women all seemed to like wine. The woman at the store where I bought the wine made some recommendations and I agreed with them. I knocked on the door and a tiny girl answered me. She looked about three or four years old to me. She looked at me with an expression mixed with curiosity and surprise. She turned her head and screamed, Mommy, that American is here! I heard movement approaching the door. Dr. Brown. Please come in! The little one stood to the side and slightly behind her mother. Big welcomed me with a smile and waved, inviting me into the house. 
She's gorgeous. Laura Tompkins is about 30 years old, I think. About 5 feet 9 inches tall. Very good looking. Long dark hair and weighs no more than 130, 135 pounds. I am constantly amazed by Irish women. I stood there like a deer in headlights until I remembered I had brought my wine with me and it was in a bag in my left hand. Where are my manners? I looked at the crumb and held out my hand. Hello, I'm Aaron, and who are you? Her expression brightened a little. My name is Matilda. I'm four years old, and my favorite book is Winnie the Pooh. Well, Matilda, it's a pleasure to meet you and learn about Winnie the Pooh. Tigger is my personal favorite. I handed the wine to Nurse Tompkins and waited for them to escort me to the kitchen or dining room. I have no idea if you like wine, so Mrs. Billings at the store recommended both of these glasses. If you don't like them, I'll be happy to replace them with others. Laura smiled. Mrs. Billings knows a thing or two about wine. Sometimes she likes it too much. But this is a good one. Would you be so kind as to open a white and pour us both a glass if you like wine? If you don't like wine, I have beer. Wine will be just fine. I busied myself with the cork and the two glasses that had been handed to me. I was under Matilda's scrutiny. I turned to her. Are you drinking wine? Laura watched me and smiled. No, you're stupid. Kids don't drink wine. We drink juice. I'll have an orange juice, please. It's good to know when I meet the other kids. I won't offer them wine. I tried not to laugh. She's very sweet. Laura smiled the whole time she was preparing our food. I offered to help, but was refused in favor of being entertained by Matilda. She was adamant that I listened to her attentively. She went off to her room and returned with a coloring book and crayons. I was politely asked to help color some of the animals on the farm. When I wanted to color a pig with a red crayon, I was told quite clearly that the pigs were not red, but beige. That's right. Dinner was beef stew with fresh cookies. We drank some more wine, and then Matilda was told to go put on her pajamas and brush her teeth. She came back a few minutes later and said I was going to read her a bedtime story. Winnie the Pooh. I looked at her mom, and she just looked at me and told Matilda to go get a book, and we could read together in the living room. While I was reading to Matilda, Laura was tidying up the kitchen and putting leftovers in the refrigerator. I watched her out of the corner of my eye and thought that this is what a real family does. This is what real life is like. Laura. Aaron was captured by my daughter. She is tiny but very effective at conquering the biggest of them all. But there was one she couldn't conquer, her father. I don't often invite men into my home, much less share dinner with me and my daughter. But this time was different. I had a pretty good idea of the man. I had information from several sources and, of course, all the things he'd done since he'd come to our shores. The fact that he was on the run from an unfaithful wife made him interesting. He knew the same pain I did. I packed Matilda's things and left her father in Dublin. I couldn't bear his disrespect. I realized that he didn't want a daughter and didn't want to take responsibility for a family at all. It was his loss. I also knew I had competition in Amelia Kelly. She was good with men. She was a little younger than me and prettier. But in a head-to-head -head competition, I had help. And I knew what Dr. Aaron Brown wanted. The look on his face as he read to Matilda spoke volumes. Aaron. Dinner with Laura was excellent. The meeting with Matilda was very interesting. I got back to my apartment around midnight, took a shower, and went to bed. If the last few days had been any indication, tomorrow was going to be a busy day. Just as I settled down on the bed, my cell phone rang. The number was from the U.S. but displayed as unknown number. I could have ignored it, but I was concerned that it might be a call from my mother or father. I answered. Hi. Aaron, is that you? I immediately realized who it was and didn't want to talk to her. Maddie, if you have something to say to me, please do it through Jimmy. I don't want to talk to you. Aaron, please don't hang up the phone. Please let me talk to you. Maddie, we have nothing to talk about. You've said everything that needed to be said. Goodbye. But I hung up and blocked the number. Amelia. My sources tell me I have competition for Dr. Brown's attention. Nurse Hottie seems to be a contender. She's certainly attractive and has her charms, but I have the advantage of not having been married before and having no children. I need to think about it and make a plan for how to proceed. Jimmy. That woman is turning into a pest. Aaron doesn't pay me enough to put up with her constant harassment. She's been told countless times that he won't talk to her, but she persists. She's nothing if not persistent. What bugs me the most is that she sicked her own boyfriend on him and got him pregnant, and now she wants Aaron to ignore her and go back to her? 
She's delusional. Damn. Aaron texted me that she somehow got his phone number in Ireland and called him. He wants me to get a restraining order from the court so she doesn't bother him. I am trying to get a judge to agree to that. In this state, divorce judges don't like to issue restraining orders unless there is a threat of physical violence. It's going to be hard to prove in this case, but I'll try. I told my client that I don't hold out much hope that we can get a restraining order. Laura. It had been a few weeks since I had met Aaron Brown, and he had already come to my house three times for dinner. On Saturday, he took Matilda and I out for a walk and picnic, and we had a great time. We went to Killarney National Park, where I've been many times and walked some trails. Matilda wanted to ride on Aaron's shoulders, and he put her on there for a while. We had lunch at the Ladies' View Cafe, and after lunch we went to Torque Falls and took some pictures that he wanted to send to Mom and Dad. That night, as Matilda lay in bed and slept soundly, we made love for the first time. I know I was nervous because he was the first man I had been with since my divorce. We spent the night together and woke up together in the morning. Aaron. Jimmy called me with the news of my divorce. My ex-wife doesn't seem to realize that I am no longer interested in marrying her. The fact that she was having fun with another guy and had a child with him is not something I am willing to overlook. Jimmy, what the hell is going on? He hesitated for only a second. I wish I knew, Aaron. I've been trying to get her to sign the papers and finish the job, but I've had no luck. I think we need to go to plan B. Okay, what's plan B? I'm going back to court and filing for a different reason. I can explain to the judge what happened to the child and see if that spurs the situation. I can file for another reason too, but it doesn't make sense since you are the one who left. It should only take a year in NY State and then it will happen automatically. But since you're the one who left, a judge might look at it differently. What about plan A, irreconcilable differences? Wasn't that the right thing to do? That's what I thought, but the judge talked about you coming home and going to counseling. I told her you have a job in another country, and she asked when you were going to come back to the United States. I replied to her that you have no immediate plans. Oh, for heaven's sake. Give me a divorce. I don't care how you do it. Just do it, please. Are you coming back? Not while I'm still married to her. I was sure I heard Jimmy say very quietly, Shit. Jimmy, make it happen, okay? I'm working on it. Maddie. I called Aaron's mother and talked to her about where Aaron was. She couldn't keep a secret and told me he was in Ireland. All I had to do was find out where he was, go to him, and fix it. I figured I could accomplish this by seeing and talking to Aaron. We had been married for four years when I started seeing Roger. I admit that Roger was a mistake, but I was single, and Aaron was in the hospital all the time. We talked a lot about starting a family. When I told Aaron that I was pregnant, he was very excited. He worked with me to paint and decorate the baby's room and gather all the things I needed. He was constantly bringing home something new for the baby. He even bought a baseball glove for the baby. He said it didn't matter if we had a boy or a girl. He was going to teach our baby how to play baseball. Aaron will realize it was a mistake to leave us. He'll love that baby when he holds her in his arms. I know he will. Roger has been avoiding me. The last few times I tried to talk to him, he didn't answer. And when I went to school, I saw that he ran away as soon as he saw me. I wonder if his wife knows about us. Maybe that's why he's avoiding me. I have to find out where Aaron is in Ireland. Then I'll get on a plane and go to him. Aaron. The hospital in Traley called, and the head of the surgical department said I had to come in for three days and help them with their backlog of surgeries. Their orthopedic doctor got sick and they had to cancel a bunch of surgeries. Doc was going to be out for a while as she was being treated for cancer. It was really bad. They needed help and I was there for them. I agreed to come for three days to help them and work on the list that had accumulated over the past month. That morning, as I was getting on my motorcycle to head to Trey Lee, I got a call from the hospital saying they had an emergency. A young guy had been hurt on his motorcycle when he hit a car coming out of his driveway. It appears the guy was going over 80 miles per hour on a secondary road, and the man looked both ways before backing up. But the guy was flying low, and so he crashed into the side of the car just past the center pillar. He went through the glass of both windows as he went through the car. His hands got caught on the center pillar and the rear superstructure of the car. He was badly mangled and needed a surgeon immediately or he could lose both arms. Just as I was about to get on my bike and start the ride to Traley, a police car pulled up, driven by the sweet and charming Constable Amelia Kelly. We've had a call from the hospital telling us to get you there quickly. There's no helicopter available, so get in. I got in the car and put on my seatbelt. 
the police car was an Audi and it got it moving. Traley is only 27 kilometers from Castlery, and we covered that distance in a matter of minutes. The police radio was chattering unintelligible gibberish, but Amelia paid no attention to it. We pulled up to the back entrance. Go save a life. Call me when you need a ride back. Thank you. I got out of the car and headed to the hospital. A nurse met me, and we went to the emergency room to examine the young man. He was sedated. I examined his injuries and began to explain to the nurse what I needed. She took some notes and left. The ambulance chief quickly told me he was glad to see me. We chatted for a few minutes and went to the surgical suite so I could get ready for work. That's what I've been training for. I met the staff at the neuro and plastic surgery clinic while I was getting cleaned up and putting on my gown and gloves. I needed magnifying glasses and was given a pair. The neurosurgeon showed me a young man's driver's license. He was only 18. Shit. Why do kids think they're invincible? I spent 11 hours reattaching both of his arms to his hands. The neurosurgeon dealt with his head injuries, and the plastic worked on getting his face back to the way it was. The child's head had gone through the helmet, and his face was torn up in all sorts of places. When I was done, I was exhausted. I really needed the restroom. My bladder was bursting and I needed food and rest. It had been the most stressful day since, well, since the day I found out Maddie cheated on me and had another man's baby. Since the day I left, I talked to the nurse who kept the surgery schedule and learned the plan for the eight surgeries I was to have over the next few days. The plan consisted of two surgeries a day for four days. It was a bit of a killer schedule, especially considering I hadn't had surgery in over a month. I decided I had to suck it up and get to work. The Irish had been kind enough to shelter me, so to speak, and I had to repay them for that. The scheduling nurse told me that they were counting on me to help them every two weeks and make sure they weren't too far behind with the surgeries. I guess I can do that. After finishing my work, I realized I had no way of getting back to Castleroy. I called the sweet and charming Constable Kelly. Half an hour later, a police car with flashing lights pulled up to the hospital. Her red hair was gathered into a ponytail. She's beautiful. What the hell am I supposed to do? Four months later. Aaron. I had just finished seeing the last patient of the day and sent Nicole home. I heard the door open and yelled that we were closed for the day. I heard footsteps and then a voice. Hi, Aaron. I looked up. Damn, how the hell did she get here? Hello, Maddie. What brings you to Ireland? Yes, of course. It took me a while to find you. You look good. I sat down. Thank you. What do you want from me, Maddie? She looked good. Motherhood was clearly coming her way. She had put on a few pounds, but they were all in the right places. I want you to come home. I want you to come home. I had a lot of anger to vent. I had to be careful not to go too far and do something stupid. I took a deep breath and exhaled. Why would you want to do that? I think you're missing a few important things. What do you think the consequences of you having an affair with that guy from your school would be? Did you really think I would just ignore the little fact that you have his kid? I may be naive, Maddie, but I'm not stupid. You have no right to have fun and ignore the consequences. I'm not the guy who's going to tell you. It's okay, honey. I'm okay with you having another man's baby. I don't mind you having fun with men. Get your head out of your ass, Maddie. She decided that the view of the floor was interesting and continued to look down. Aaron, you have to come home. I need you and your daughter. Oh, for crying out loud. Have you lost your mind, woman? I don't have a daughter. You and your boyfriend have a daughter. Let him watch his daughter. Go the hell home. But we've been married for four years and we love each other. I love you and I know you love me. Come home, please. You don't love me. If you love me so much, why were you having fun with that guy? Tell me that. You were never home and I was lonely and Roger was around and we talked a lot. Oh, well, so you're having fun with him just fine. I guess. When did you get that head injury? The one that made you forget that we weren't supposed to be having fun with each other? Maddie had a hard time answering. Can you just think about it? I really miss you and I know you can be a good father. I couldn't believe the nonsense that was coming out of her brain and mouth. And then I was saved. I heard the door open and Amelia walked in. She was dressed in tight jeans and a sleeveless blouse. Her hair was styled and she only had light makeup on her eyes. Amelia is very good and today she looked especially good. When she walked in, I walked over to her and kissed her. I stood with my arms around her waist. Amelia, you're just in time. Let me introduce you to Maddie. 
Maddie somehow managed to find me here in beautiful Ireland, I said with a smile. Amelia stood with her arms around my waist, looking at Maddie like she was a mushroom on crackers. Amelia looked her over from head to toe. Then she turned to face me and said, Aaron, you won't be long. We're meeting my parents for dinner around six o'clock. No, Maddie was just leaving. We said everything we had to say to each other. I looked directly at Maddie. Isn't that right, Maddie? Maddie doesn't take hints very well. Aaron, we need to have a serious talk about what you're doing. Amelia intervened. Well, Maddie, we'll have to wait until another day. Aaron and I have to get on the road or we'll be late, and my mom and dad are sticklers for punctuality. I'm sure you understand me now. Amelia gave Maddie a fierce look. If this was going on in a pub, the lads would have gathered closer, expecting a physical fight between the two women. In Ireland, you could sell tickets to see it. I wasn't going to give Maddie the hope that I was stupid enough to listen to her ramblings. She could talk until the proverbial cows came home, and it wouldn't matter in the slightest. After all, she was involved in a sexual relationship with another man and had a child with him as a result. I sympathize with the child. She doesn't get to choose who her mother and father are. She deserves a better mother than the one she got. I knew that my hardworking attorney had been to court and that the final dissolution of marriage certificate was imminent. Maddie was trying to escape having to raise a child alone and facing being a single mom. She should have thought about this before she started having fun with this guy and got pregnant. Jimmy made me aware of all the court dates and statements he had filed, and the judge acknowledged that the baby was not mine. The judge asked who the father of the child was, and Maddie's attorney simply said that they recognized that I was not the father. According to Jimmy, the judge made a face and response that spoke volumes. In the end, Maddie would keep the house and our bank accounts instead of money from me, and since there were no children in our marriage, no further support in any form. I knew Maddie would walk away with a little over $90,000 after the sale of the house and our small savings account, but I considered the money well spent as a life lesson for me. I was in no hurry to find a replacement for myself at the moment. I planned to spend a few more months here in Ireland, become a local doctor, assist in operations, and think about what I wanted to do. But life doesn't always go according to plan. Maddie. Well, it didn't go the way I wanted it to. That hobo with the red hair interrupted me. I left the baby with my mom and dad at home and thought that if I came here and showed Aaron what he was giving up, maybe he would come home and we could try to be a family. I've been trying really hard to lose the extra pounds from my pregnancy and get back into shape. I got back into my size 6 jeans and brought out the perfume that I know Aaron really likes. But the bitch showed up and I know she was wearing Chanel perfume. I could smell it. That whore better think again if she thinks I'm going to leave without a fight. The hotel room I'm staying in is tiny. I can barely squeeze between the bed and the desk. And the TV is so old it has a picture tube. How the hell do these people live like this? I need to find something to eat and call my mom. She told me to visit her every day. She wasn't happy about taking the baby. She said she was getting a lot of questions, mostly from her friends who didn't know I adopted the baby. I don't think she is correcting them. Aaron. What the hell? This stunned woman actually showed up here in Ireland. How the hell did she find me? I have a good idea, one of my chatty relatives accidentally told her. She should listen more closely to what her lawyer tells her. The divorce is almost final. There's no going back. We're done, we're done, we're done. I was really happy to see Amelia. She made up the part about meeting mom and dad, at least I think she did. I took her out to dinner. Afterward, I took her to my humble apartment. And the next morning, I made her breakfast. Maddie. Last night after having dinner, I took a walk around the village. It's nothing special. I can't understand what Aaron likes about this place. They call restaurants pubs. I learned that it's short for brothel. I learned that Aaron only sees patients three days a week. The people in the pub knew everything about him and, surprisingly, were willing to tell me almost everything they knew. I went back to my hotel, a small establishment run by a couple named Mary and Bill. She offered tea and we talked about the doctor and how they really considered him a local hero. They told me about how Aaron had saved a policeman and about a traffic accident he had helped tourists in. Mary asked where I was from, and when I said I was from Albany, she looked at me wide-eyed and did the math. She realized that I was Aaron's wife. She quickly said she had some things to do in the kitchen and left me alone. I heard her and Bill talking in quiet voices. The next morning, I arrived at Aaron's clinic and was greeted by a teenager at the front desk. I told her I was here to see Aaron. She looked at me, and I knew she knew who I was. Word travels fast in this small town. I was told he would not be in today. 
It was surgery day at the hospital in Traley, wherever it was. I asked when his next appointment would be. The teenager looked at the appointment book on her desk and said the doctor was busy all this week. Maybe I could come back next Monday. My goodness, these people. I walked around the city some more and had a cup of terrible coffee. The weather was starting to be nice when I left the hotel, but now it was fogging and the city seemed incredibly small. I had no idea where to go to wait it out. I didn't know where he lived. Maybe he was living with last night's red-headed skank. I'd ask around and see what I could find out. The mayor of Castlery. I received a call from Garda informing me that there was an American woman in town inquiring about Dr. Brown. She was staying with Mary and Bill at their hotel. It did not take Inspector Cluzo to explain that it was Mrs. Brown, with whom we had parted, who was trying to get our doctor to return to Albany. We had to put a quick end to it. A quick call from Mary informed me that this woman, Madeline Brown, had gone to the doctor's office looking for him. I know he was in Traley today, operating on the hips and knees of those who needed new ones. No, I needed to get the estranged Mrs. Brown to come home and leave young Aaron alone. Luckily, I have Constable Amelia Kelly on my team. Amelia is a world-class beauty who can attract any man just by looking at him and beckoning him to her with her index finger. She may be the most beautiful woman in the region and certainly in Castlery. I know that her career as a police officer is about to end, as she has entered the law faculty of Trinity College Dublin. Her father is an alumnus of that college, and she will undoubtedly succeed there. I talked to Mary and Bill, and it turned out that the bed and breakfast would have to close immediately due to a safety violation. I had no choice but to tell the only guest that she had to leave immediately. Her belongings were packed and ready to move. Bill apologized profusely, gave her all her money back, and said he had booked a room for her at the nearest hotel with rooms available, which happened to be in Killarney. To say she was really pissed at Bill is to say that, uh, we had to sacrifice everything to get a doctor for our town. Bill understood that very clearly. Maddie, the goddamn hotel just kicked me out, telling me some bullshit story about having to close because the state health inspector shut them down. And now I have to go to someplace called Killarney, wherever it is. And it's raining hard? I hate Ireland. Also, my mom calls me and asks me when I'm coming home. Damn. I just got an email from school on my cell phone, reminding me that my maternity leave ends in about a week and I'll have to go back to work. Shit. Amelia. Here's the thing. I really wanted Aaron to meet my mother and father. He's probably the best of the best guys I've ever dated. He has real standards that he's not willing to give up just because someone, even his unfaithful wife, asks him to. That counts for something. My problem is that I will have to break up with him soon, as I will be moving to Dublin in August. Law school classes start, and I need to get there, get settled in and ready for new endeavors. My other problem is that when I get to Dublin, I won't be ready to lead a celibate lifestyle. I like sex, I really do. So it wouldn't be fair to him to say that I still want to see him, while I myself am doing it with other men in the meantime, knowing that he won't be seeing other women. That would be wrong. So I have to end it. The sooner the better, I think. Aaron, I learned some important information from the Castleroy Gossip Network. I call it CGN for short. I know that Amelia is a long shot. I know her goal is to get into law school, and the Gossip Network has informed me through Nicole that she has been accepted and will begin classes in August. I know she is a very outgoing woman, and I know that in the long run, I am not the right person for her. I know that if I were with her, I would just wait for the day when I find out she is having sex with another guy, and I know that will eventually be the end of it for me. For my own salvation, I need to remember that my relationship with her is short-term, and it's just entertainment. When she's ready, she'll tell me, and that will be the end of it. I'm certainly not going to say something stupid to her, use the L word and promise her my boundless love. No. Besides, there's a person or people I'd like to get to know a lot better than I know them now. Four months later. Aaron. The doctor the Department of Health had promised to send in my place didn't seem to be forthcoming. I haven't heard any names, so I called the hospital administrator in Tralee and spoke to them. They said they would get back to me. That was weeks ago, but still no word. Amelia is a law student in Dublin, and we parted on very amicable terms. We both knew that our relationship would not develop into something permanent. We both knew we were just friends with benefits. But these were great advantages. Laura, it's been a few months since Amelia Kelly left for school in Dublin. I had been busy with work and Matilda, so my social life, as they say, had taken a back seat. So I was surprised when I got a call from Aaron inviting us to go with him to the fair in Killarney for the weekend. 
I figured with Amelia gone, the good doctor was lonely and wanted female companionship. Well, lucky him. I needed male company. I have needs too. When I told Matilda she was very excited about going to the fair, she ran to her room to gather her clothes, even though it was only Wednesday evening and we were not going until Saturday afternoon. When Saturday came, I had completely forgotten that Aaron had a motorcycle and expected him to show up and we would head to Killarney in my car. To my surprise, he showed up with a car. An Audi sedan. Apparently, the mayor of Castlery had arranged a short-term lease for it at a very cheap rate. All he had to do was pay the insurance and fill it up with gas. It meant he could drive to Traley every week for his shift at the surgery in much greater comfort than if he had to put up with the fickle Irish weather on a motorcycle. Matilda climbed into the back seat and buckled her seatbelt, but I made her get out to put her baby seat in the car. She watched Aaron as he buckled it in. The fair was a lot of fun. Matilda didn't mind the rides, wanted cotton candy and all the junk food I allowed. She walked around the fairgrounds, holding Aaron's hand the whole time. I watched his face to see what he thought of his job. I think he liked it. After the fair, we went out for some real food and then went back to my house. I invited Aaron in. Matilda got into her pajamas, brushed her teeth without asking, and then went back into the kitchen, took Aaron's hand, and dragged him to her room. He was instructed to read a bedtime story. Half an hour later, he reappeared. She's a heavy sleeper. The food and fresh air have finished her off. I smiled at him. You've earned your drink, I handed him the wine glass. How do you do it? I was stumped by the question. What to do? Spend your days caring for difficult patients and your evenings and weekends caring for your very busy daughter. I don't overthink it. I just do it. I can't remember my life before Matilda. She's the most important part of my life. Everything else is secondary. He sipped his wine. How could your ex-husband refuse her? I don't understand. Some men aren't cut out to be husbands and fathers. He's one of those. If she was mine, well, I couldn't think about it. I never think about it. Matilda is my everything. I took a sip. But that doesn't mean I don't want more. I looked at him carefully. What do you want? We talked late into the night. He told me what it was like to be betrayed by his ex-wife. How he felt when he saw that her child was clearly another man's. How he felt cheated. How he'd been used. She had been unfaithful for a long time and hid it well. He told me that if she had been honest with him about not wanting to be married to him, he would have gotten a divorce and she could live the life she wanted, and so could he. Aaron was divorced, and that gave him a sense of freedom that he was just beginning to get used to. There was a newness to his life. His eyes had been opened and he was going to make sure history didn't repeat itself. He was going to be very sure of what he wanted and who he wanted to be with. I knew a little girl was eyeing him to make her new daddy. So far, so good. Jimmy. Look, your divorce has been formalized for some time now. I sent you the original divorce decree, and I have a copy of it on file in case you ever need it. You're a single man in Ireland, and you can get into all sorts of trouble. Jimmy, I can't thank you enough. Just pay my bill when you get it. I got worried when Maddie showed up here in Ireland. What the hell was she trying to do by coming here? Her family was really pissed at her and told her to sort her shit out. She decided she was going to give you one last chance. When you blew her off, she came home and is still playing the role of a struggling single mom. What about the guy who's the father of her baby? Oh, he's got enough problems with his wife and kids, and he's completely ignoring Maddie. He's scared to death she's going to start demanding child support from him. And he doesn't have shit to give her. That's ridiculous. What about you? Are you going to return home anytime soon, or are you going to become a full citizen of Ireland? I don't know. I have to admit it's different here, but I like it a lot. I met a wonderful woman who I think could make me very happy. She has a daughter. What the hell? Yes. She's a nurse practitioner and she has a four-year-old daughter. She's smart, beautiful, and a great mom. But the baby isn't yours. No, but she didn't deceive me or lie to me. There's a difference between her and Maddie. A big difference. Maddie betrayed me, deceived me, and lied to me. You can't argue with that. When her child was born and I saw that I was not the father, it all came down on me like a transport truck. At that moment, I realized that my marriage to her was over. So I had to leave Albany. The farther away, the better. Well, you have accomplished that goal, my friend. Thank you for everything you've done for me. Two years later. Aaron. Aaron, it's time. Oh, shit, I'll get the bag now. I ran to the closet by the front door, pulled out the bag we had packed, and got ready to get in the car. 
I called the hospital to let them know we were leaving. My mother and father were there and fussed around us as we got out of the car. Matilda stood there and hugged us both. Bring me home a baby, brother. I laughed as I put Laura in the car. The Garda had provided us with a police escort all the way to the hospital in Tralee. Nine hours later, our baby was born. I mentally noted that the next child might be the brother Matilda had hoped for. My parents arrived at the hospital with Matilda, and they were all able to see the baby girl. Annabelle Marie Brown ignored all the attention and was content to hold my finger while I held her. Laura. That's right, I have the last word. I am very lucky to have found a man who wants to be a family man. Plus, he's been happy to take responsibility for a wife and child from the start. Aaron is mine, but I'll have to share him with Matilda and now Annabelle and probably someone else. I can't understand women who don't know when they're doing well. Aaron's ex was stupid, and her stupidity was my good fortune. She screwed up and lost him because of it. When he found me and I found him, we were two people looking for each other. We found each other by pure chance, but I'm so glad we found each other. And I think, no, I know Aaron feels the same way. We're a family now. And by God, if anyone gets in the way, I'm the one to deal with. I'm an Irish wife and mother, and I don't tolerate other women making eyes at my husband. That includes you, Amelia Kelly. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. So subscribe to my channel and watch the next video.